Welcome everyone to this installment uh, in our month long celebration, actually a little more than a month long celebration of Native American Heritage Month here at the University of Missouri. It is my distinct pleasure to be able to introduce um, our speaker for today, Dr. DeAndre Smiles, who's Assistant Professor of Geography <clears throat> at the University of Victoria in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. First, though, let's take a moment to acknowledge that the University of Missouri is located within the traditional lands of the Washashe or Osage Nation. And there are many other indigenous nations who have homes, lands, and re relationships within the US state now called Missouri, along with those of other nations who pass through this state on forced removals and relocations. Now, there's all kinds of different opinions about land acknowledgments and a healthy debate about land acknowledgements these days. But for me, one of the reasons I feel it's important to make this kind of acknowledgement, um, whether it's at the university setting or here on a Zoom call, is just to remember that land is bigger than the university. Land is here for us, for all of us. Um, and there are all kinds of places that can help guide us in reckoning with the realities of our coexistence and to help get us to new relationships that are more skillful, mutually beneficial and healthy. So uh, it's in that spirit that I make this acknowledgement. Um, I also want to acknowledge a couple of people. Uh, first, Dr. Joseph Erb, who is the master of ceremonies when it comes to Native American Heritage Month, not just this year, but several, several years running actually. And I would encourage you to check out all of the other events uh, upcoming for uh, Native American Heritage Month. I've put the link um, in the chat. And if you click on that link, you will see that um, the next uh, upcoming event is actually this week on November 10th at uh, four o'clock. It's a beating workshop hosted by our very own Four Directions Indigenous Peoples and Allies. Um, and there are some other, uh, still more, many more great events for uh, Native American Heritage Month. And many, many thanks to Dr. Erb for really being the leader on um, the, our celebration of this very important time uh, this year. Also, I wanna give a shout out to Dr. Aida Gulenkozi, who knows Dr. Smiles personally and was able to convince him to talk to us despite his new job and his busy schedule. Now, I don't know how much convincing it actually took, but for me, it was so fun to have Dr. Gulenkozi, who is a new postdoctoral scholar here at the University of Missouri, introduce me to someone I had been wanting to meet for quite a long time now. So it's cool how these circles circle around. Um, and last but definitely not least, I want to acknowledge the Department of Geography for supporting Dr. Smiles' talk today, and also the College of Arts and Science for supporting Native American Heritage Month in general. In particular, I'd like to recognize Kelly Buchheit from Arts and Science, who's done really an amazing job with logistics, coordination, fiscal stuff, advertising, W9s I hear, <laughs> among many other things uh, to, to make, um, Native American Heritage Month happens so smoothly for us. Now, as I said, it is my distinct pleasure to be able to introduce to you all, Dr. DeAndre Smiles, uh, who identifies as Ojibwe Black and Settler and is a citizen of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. He's an indigenous geographer who studies critical indigenous geographies, human environment interactions, political ecology, tribal cultural resource preservation, and science and technology studies. His current research looks at how the knowledge uh, that has been learned by tribal nations uh, centered around the protection of deceased tribal members, including burial grounds, site protection, and preservation, can be extended to the protection of the living environment, including non-human kin in this era of climate crisis and species extinction. He got his bachelor's degree in geography from St. Cloud State University, his master's degree in global indigenous studies from the University of Minnesota Duluth, and his PhD in geography from the 
Ohio State University, <laughs> where he was also a president's postdoctoral scholar in the Department of History. And as I mentioned earlier, he is now a new assistant professor at the University of Victoria in British Columbia, Canada. And he's just one of those scholars, you know their work is really going to make a difference. So I'm gonna step out of the way and make room for the main event. Please help me welcome Dr. DeAndre Smiles. All right, thank you so, so much, Soren. Uh, it's, it's very high praise hearing that from a man whose work that he has done has deeply influenced the type of work that I do. Um, I still refer to the series of uh, works that he did with Jay Johnson on, on more than human beings and in, 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 uh, in being sense and place. Um, and it's been a major influence behind my current research agenda. Um, it's great to see you all. Um, it's a beautiful fall evening. I, I wish that I could have the stunning backdrop of Victoria in my background, but it is our reading break. And I happen to be home in Columbus, Ohio, where my wife is completing a doctoral degree at Ohio State, um, as well as with my cat, um, who probably will do her best to not show up near the, near the computer. She's learned by now that if she comes near the computer when I'm talking, I pick her up and I put her on camera. Um, uh, so if that happens, expect to see the cat, but she probably will stay away. But anyways, um, I'm happy to be here with you all to help uh, recognize Native American Heritage Month, which is extremely important. And I'm here to talk to you all today about uh, something that's really near and dear to my heart, which is something that I entitle Geographic Indigenous Futures. So... When I first conceptualized this talk, when Dr. Gulen Cozy and, and, and Dr. Larson approached me about it and I began working on this, uh, the initial version uh, was quite long, uh, about two hours. That's a joke, it wasn't nearly that long. Um, but as, uh, as an Anishinaabe man, my typical predilection is to go off and tell stories and things like that. So I'm going to do my best to keep it to a neat 50 minutes today, uh, maybe even a little bit shorter if I can really rein in my impulse to tell stories. And I'm gonna to talk to you about something that's really, really important facing us as humanity, which is climate crisis. Talk about the ways that it has affected indigenous peoples. Talk to you about the ways that geographers are well positioned to approach this. Um, as well as maybe going a little bit into some of the challenges that we face as a discipline and whose voices to elevate when talking about this. And to tell you a little bit about the work that I am doing at the University of Victoria in this regard. Um, I view my pr presentations as a interactive learning experience. And so if there are questions that pop up during the talk, if there are things that, that you want to know more about, please pop it in the pop it in the chat function. Um, if I see that chat function like pop up in the way that it does on Zoom, I might stop and answer it. Um, of course, if you prefer to adhere to the traditional ask questions at the end of the talk, um, we will have time to do that as well. Um, but as I always say to my classes, um, because this really is the truth, we have a lot to talk about and not a lot of time to do it. But as I said, I like telling stories. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how I came to the field of geography. So my mother worked really, really hard to raise me. And I probably didn't make it incredibly easy for her, but as a single mother, as a single uh, indigenous woman raising her child um, on the South side of Minneapolis and then in the suburbs of the Twin Cities, um, one of the things that she always wanted to make sure is that I would be as well set up as possible to do well in school and to try to make a better life for myself than even she had. And one of those things that she would do to make sure that I was well set up is she would take me to read. Um, some of the, her proudest stories were of um, me saying my first word based on, oops, not gonna share that just yet, um, saying my first word based on a newspaper article that I read at two years of age. Um, I spoke a little bit earlier than that, but I was reading at two. Um, uh, and the mountains of books that I would bring home from the library when she would take me to the library. One of the things that I really, really enjoyed reading from a young age were maps. Maps were something that were really fascinating to me. I really loved learning about places and learning about the peoples that live there. And it was a way for this kid growing up in 
in urban Minnesota to transport himself to places who, where he had never been before. So one of my favorite maps that I had as a kid and regretfully um, with the passage of time, uh, I was given away or more likely it probably was falling up, it, it probably was thrown away because it was falling apart from me reading it was so often, was the 1990s version of the Rand McNally Kids United States Road Atlas. I read this book cover to cover. I read this map, this atlas cover to cover multiple times. Um, by the age of six, I could tell you the names of every single state in the United States. I could tell you its capital. I probably could get really close to telling you its population or at least in the 1990s census because keep in mind, this was the 1990s when this was happening. And I read this so much and eventually I realized that, oh, hey, there's other maps out there. And so I started to ask my mom to buy me maps. And by the time I was in high school, I had a collection of probably like 50 to 60 maps on most of them that I still have today sitting on my shelf in my office in Victoria um, over a wide variety of things. I have maps um, ranging from you know, your typical US road atlases to maps of every single major and minor league team in the United States to a map created by one of my favorite gas station chains in the world, uh, Quick Trip, and that's for, because I know you folks in Missouri also have Quick Trip, it's spelled with a K in Minnesota, not a Q. Uh, I have a map of every single Quick Trip with a K location in the upper Midwest. Um, but you know, when I was building this map collection, I began to realize that, hey, I'm actually really, really good at geography. I really, really enjoy this. And so geography classes were those things that I really, really excelled in. I really looked forward to taking them in grade school and high school. Um, for those of you that have participated in the National Geographic uh, state level geography bees, I made it to the state geography bee as an eighth grader and finished in the top five. Um, I got to I got to high school, I got to my senior year, and they asked me. DeAndre, do you know what you want to major in when you go to college? And growing up as a kid of color, right, um, you, you sometimes you don't have folks that are really thinking that you're going to make, make much of yourself. And even in high school, uh, my, my guidance counselors are like, oh, maybe, you know, DeAndre, maybe you ought to you ought to look into, you know, community college or you need to maybe look into the trades because besides geography, uh, I wasn't the most distinguished student. But my mother always told me um, every morning, she would wake me up and say, good morning, kid is gonna go to college and it stuck into my mind. And so by the time I was a senior, um, any hopes of pushing me into the trades were pretty much shot. I was like, I'm going to university and I'm gonna major in geography. And so I did so. I went off to St. Cloud State, this little, um, well, not so little, but kind of sort of well-known state university in central Minnesota and majored in geography and started taking geography classes. But I always asked myself, well, what do I want to do with geography? I, for the longest time, I thought about doing cartographies, but it was something that never really grabbed onto me, right? The GIS classes, um, for you GIS inclined folks, GIS is fine, not really my thing. Um, and then I thought about, well, maybe land surveying. Nah, surveying is not my thing. Uh, the human geography classes were the ones that really stuck out to me. And it was during my junior year that uh, another kind of group that I was involved with on campus, which was our American Indian Center, I, I accompanied them on a trip to the Northern Cheyenne Nation in Eastern Montana. Now, for those of you that are maybe a bit familiar with the Northern Cheyenne, or I suppose maybe for those of you that are not familiar, the Northern Cheyenne have probably one of the coolest and kind of simultaneously most tragic history out of any indigenous nations in the United States. They were, they were located here in the foothills of Eastern Montana. They were pushed down into the Great Plains through processes of relocation. They escaped, were chased by the United States Army back up into Montana, where there was a series of battles, um, the Battle of the Little Bighorn or the Battle of the Greasy Grass, where uh, General Custer met his end. Um, that, was, that was somewhat connected to this as well. Um, but for all of this, the Northern Cheyenne were allowed to remain in their homelands. And we learned this history as we did a number of service activities with the Boys and Girls Club and got to talk to tribal leaders. And one of the big things that was going on at this time was that the Northern Cheyenne were dealing with the question of whether to allow coal extraction on the reservation. The neighboring nation, the Crow Nation, allows coal mining and has seen a lot of uh, prosperity from that. And the Northern Cheyenne 
Um, similarly to a lot of tribal nations in the United States, um, dealing with processes of and, and challenges related to poverty, among other things. And the debate was, well, if we allowed coal mining on the reservation, it would lift us out of poverty almost immediately, and we would be able to provide for our people and be able to provide for future generations. But an even larger contingent of tribal members said, if you think about how hard we fought in order to be able to stay in our homelands, why would we allow this extractive industry to come in to basically destroy this beautiful landscape? Um, and talking to one of the governmental members, one of their members of their tribal council, they said, we would rather be poor and live here in our country as the creator intended rather than allow this coal mining to come in and destroy this land that we fought so hard to hold on to. And that was the moment that changed everything for me. And I said, okay, there's obviously a very strong component of space and place here. And I want to tie that together with the lessons that I'm learning in geography. Um, St. Cloud State University did not have an indigenous geography class. And from then on forward, I decided I want to bring indigenous studies and indigenous viewpoints into conversation with geography. Of course, me being 20 year old uh, college student, didn't know that people had already been doing that for a long time, but uh, wouldn't you, would, you know, wouldn't you think, uh, wouldn't you be surprised to kind of learn how excited I was when I got to grad school at the University of Minnesota Duluth and realized that this was a burgeoning field of study. So I pushed on forward. Um, it's kind of another story from St. Cloud State. I wasn't doing, um, there was a German professor that I wasn't doing well in his class. And he said, DeAndre, you could be a college professor if you just applied yourself and started showing up to class. And that was another moment where I was like, okay, I know what I wanna do. So by the time I got my PhD or I was going for my PhD from Ohio State, I was very firmly in the camp of, I'm an indigenous geographer that I really want to bring indigenous perspectives in the conversation with geography. And I wanna be a professor. Now I could talk uh, probably for another uh, two hours about um, my own research and, my, and the path that I took, but, um, in the interest of time, in the interest of preserving your attention and not uh, killing you off from sheer boredom, um, I want to turn to explaining uh, a key concept that I'm going to be talking about today um, when talking about climate crisis, anthropogenic crisis, and how it relates to Indigenous peoples. That actually does connect to this story about the Northern Cheyenne. And that term is settler colonialism. Now, many of you have heard of this term. Uh, some of you have not. I firmly believe in, in teaching to the lowest common denominator, which is usually the one where people, you know, folks that may not be as familiar with this term. So settler colonialism, it's a form of colonialism that centers around the occupation of land by a, by a group, settlers or external people not from that territory at the expense of indigenous peoples of that land. So these spaces that are colonized are referred to as settler colonies and settler colonies include the good old United States of America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, um, South Africa, Israel, um, but also there's a bird, these are, these are commonly referred to as Anglo settler colonies. These all have in common that they were connected to the British crown, whether they were colonies at one point or in the case of Israel, a, a British mandate and they gained their independence, um, but still, you know, English is a common language that's spoken there, and there are elements of, of, of kind of white British culture that kind of remain in these places. Um, there's a growing subset of literature that talks about, well, settler colonialism happens in other places as, as well, um, such as Latin America, um, Asia, other places in Africa. Um, and that's really, really important to kind of broaden our scope. But generally, when you hear about settler colonialism, it's always based in, it's you, more than often based in these kind of Anglo colonies. So settler col colonialism, it diff it's for the longest time, the scholar Patrick Wolf and others defined it as being not so much concerned about extraction of resources, but really concerned about land. Uh, Patrick Wolf in, in, in particular talked about, well, in the, in the logics of the settler state, land is life. Um, a scholar named Cy Englert in Antipode um, last year came out with an article that talked about, well, actually settler colonialism, if we think about it from a Marxist viewpoint, actually is, is concerned with, with extraction um, through the control of land. The idea is that, well, if we control the land, we can mine it, we can farm it, we can do all of these things with it, and we can create a capitalist class in the settler colony. Um, and so that's a key distinction that, that has been there and one that's increasingly being challenged. 
So Patrick Wolf, one thing that still kind of endures, um, despite the fact that there has been kind of a recent turn against Wolf and kind of his fellow um, white academic kin in, as, as kind of the voices of settler colonial studies, um, Patrick Wolf states, well, settler colonialism is a structure, not an event. And what Wolf means by this is that while there is obviously a start date for colonization, um, there is never an end date. Settler colonialism is never going to reach the point where it says, okay, well, we've done all we can do here. Let's pack up and we'll head back to Europe. The idea is that settler colonialism is constantly concerned with building structures to make sure that it endures to the present day. That's something that I talked about in previous work that I did. As I said, we, if we, we can't think about the settler state, the settler colony is just a monolith, like the settler state. Actually, what it is, it's, it's, a, it's a series of different structures such as government and law enforcement and educational institutions and industry and all of these different things that can articulate themselves and rearticulate themselves at will towards one goal, which is the elimination of indigenous peoples and enduring control over land. So one of the really key ways that I show kind of this over this kind of erosion of land from the viewpoints of the United States is this is I'll sh show this via this animated map by somebody named Sam Hilliard, who is at Louisiana State University. And this will show you kind of the gradual erosion of indigenous presence in the expansion and consolidation of the settler states um, in the United States in particular, which is where I'm going to spend most of our time talking about today. So I'll take you through this map um, a couple of times here. So this is beginning of colonization. The green represents indigenous lands kind of from a broad point. I'll take you through it uh, a couple more times here just to show you kind of that broad, the kind of the growth of the United States and how it ate away at indigenous lands. All right, so how does this relate to the environment? Well, settler colonialism in establishing control over the land, um, it also affected widespread changes to landscape. So what happened when settlers pushed indigenous peoples off the land? Well, they did things with that land, such as creation of farms, um, in particular in the Southeast, uh, the plantation economy, was created through the brutal subjugation and ex expulsion of indigenous nations there combined with um, the brutal chattel slavery of, of black slaves brought over from Africa. Um, this also um, kind of similar processes occurred in, in on the East Coast and uh, kind of the non-slavery equivalent happened in what we call the old Northwest as well, where indigenous peoples were just simply pushed off and settlers either appropriated indigenous farmland that was there, um, that was existing, or they just simply created new farmland. Um, also extraction of natural resources. Um, one of the things I'm working on a manuscript right now talking about logging and how this is a function of settler colonialism, uh, mining things such as coal mining. Um, the California gold rush was another great example of this. Um, the overhunting of animals, um, uh, widespread land theft, right? Uh, your, your friends over there at the University of Oklahoma and their, uh, their nickname, the Sooners, um, that, that came from people that snuck over into the Indian territory right before um, it opened up to uh, land claims in the, in the late 19th century. Um, you know, this, was, this, this just was part of this widespread um, environmental and, land, and changes to the landscapes. Um, and this is, this is extended to the present day, right? So there's also modern day contestations over extractive industries um, such as mining. So the story that I told just a few minutes ago about the Northern Cheyenne and coal mining on their reservation, this is one such contestation. Um, pipeline developments. Um, the picture here on the right um, is a picture that is something that usually takes at least a few people by surprise whenever I, I, I show it in my talks because it really is striking. 
So when we think about oil spills in the United States, right, and we, we think about things like the, you know, the Exxon Valdez oil spill in, in Alaska or the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, um, we don't, we oftentimes don't realize that the largest inland oil spill in United States history happened in the middle of northern Minnesota in the early 1990s. On a cold day, winter day in March 1991, uh, Enbridge's Line 3 pipeline uh, sprung a leak, um, literally over a tributary of the Mississippi River, um, I literally five miles outside of the boundaries of my own reservation, right? About five miles outside of Leech Lake Sovereign Lands, this happens. And millions of gallons of oil spilled out onto this frozen river. And to this day, people say, we're lucky that that river was frozen because if it hadn't been the, the the oil would have gotten into the Mississippi in a matter of hours and would have contaminated a major part of the upper Mississippi watershed for millions of people drinking water, all kinds of uses for that water would have been basically um, wiped away by this oil spill. And this is a good example of my argument that indigenous lands are placed at peril from these changes, right? Um, we think about these oil, these spills, we think about resource extraction, we think about even things is is uh, kind of hard to fathom as the Pick Sloan Act and the development of, of reservoirs on the Missouri River um, through this project where millions of acres of indigenous lands were flooded in the name of irrigation and in hydropower development and recreation. Um, something that uh, Nick Estes talks about in his book, um, Our History is Our Future, for example. So indigenous lands are ground zero for the settler colonial disregard of the environment. Other examples that I talk about quite often, um, kind of more specific examples here. So this is a picture of an abandoned uh, uranium mine on the Navajo Nation. The Navajo Nation was host to uranium mining for many, many decades. Um, after the advent of the United States' nuclear program, obviously both used for military and commercial and, and uh, power development uses. And the idea was that, well, we need to get uranium from someplace to power these things, but we want to make sure that it's a source in the United States so that we have control over it and so that we're not placed at the risk of a foreign power shutting off our access, right? Um, during, during the Cold War, geopolitical positioning was of the utmost importance and we wanted to make sure that we were providing for our security, um, how secure we were by uh, mass producing weapons that could kill humanity multiple times over. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a, a debate for another time, I think. But in the meantime, this uranium mining happens on these tribal nations, on the Navajo Nation and uh, other neighboring nations in the Southwest. And the Navajo Nation was a participant in these things, but I argue that they were less than a willing participant. The idea here was that, well, th these mines will provide jobs for our people. We are dealing with poverty and other kind of societal kind of issues brought about by colonialism. We might as well participate in this. And the idea was that, well, they're gonna do it anyway. So as long as we're doing this, we'll have a seat at the table and we'll be able to have some form of input on it. Well, these mines were constructed, they were, they were used, and then they were abandoned when the uranium deposits ran out. And this, uh, this created other issues. Uh, obviously, these mines were not properly remediated when they were, when they were done being used. And so these, these were contaminated spaces. Um, there were Nav Navajo tribal members, Diné tribal members that were in the mines with little to no protection and dealt with, dealt with um, enduring health effects from this. And there's just widespread environmental contamination, which led to uh, protests in the 1970s onwards about these things and has led to efforts by the Navajo Nation to try to uh, remediate these sites and to mitigate uh, effects that are enduring from these, these mines. Um, keeping with that nuclear theme, another example that I often like to tell. So this is the Prairie Island Nuclear Power Plant. Um, this is located along the Mississippi River. That's this, this, this body of water um, right here in the, in the background, about 45 minutes uh, southeast of the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, little, little child DeAndre, when he flipped on a light switch in his apartment, and, and there his, his uh, apartment that his mom and he lived in in South Minneapolis, our power more than likely was coming from this, this uh, plant here at Prairie Island. 
So Prairie Island is a nuclear power plant built in the 1970s by uh, Xcel Energy, um, the local utilities provider. And it has a fairly good safety record, right? Um, we haven't seen a meltdown like Chernobyl here, we have, or Fukushima, or Three Mile Island, and they've, they've, they've passed all their safety drills. But there is always a bit of anxiety in, in Minnesota um, about the location of this power plant for two reasons. So I know you folks in the Midwest are going to resonate with this quite well, right? Where we talk about, um, we talk about flooding and we talk about, uh, you know, April showers bring May flowers. Uh, oftentimes we also talk about April showers brings May flooding, right? Or, you know, especially in recent years on April flooding. And so we deal with these effects of these rivers overflowing, um, overflowing their banks and causing damage. So um, for those of you that don't know kind of the process of how nuclear power is, is developed, uh, the idea is that, um, you know, you use the, these, these fuel sources and when it's done, you have to put the nuclear waste somewhere. At Prairie Island, what they've been doing is they store the waste in these, in these concrete casks, which I believe these are, these are them located right here, right? The fear is that, well, if there is a 500 year flood or a flood where the Mississippi River crests the levels that have not, that, that happen once every 500 years, right? This is kind of like a catastrophic level flood. The fear is that not only will it cause a plant to shut down, but it could, it could potentially pick up the cast through, you know, through fast moving water and pull them into the Mississippi River. And nobody really knows what might happen if those casts are submerged for long periods of time. They think that they'll be able to uh, they'll be able to withstand it, but nobody knows for sure. So again, we deal with an issue of contamination of a major source of drinking water for a lot of people. The other thing is the Prairie Island Dakota community, which is an indigenous community there in in southeastern Minnesota, is literally located right next door to the power plant. Um, actually, you probably tribal land would probably start about right here. It's out of frame in the picture. The nuclear power plant is located about 500 yards away from the tribal community's child care center. The tribe really did not have input in the, the building or location of this power plant. And so this, the Prairie Island has to deal with that, with that legacy and that ongoing presence of a potential you know, disaster waiting to happen located right next door. Turning back to our, uh, our uh, good friend, and I use that word very, very loosely, line three, uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing this kind of process of, of the rebuilding of line three. And so this is a controversy that's happening in Minnesota right now, right? This is the existing route of line three. Uh, as you see here, it runs right through the middle of my reservation, literally runs about, oh, I'd say a thousand feet away from my family's burial ground and kind of the kind of ancestral kind of um, settlement that we've lived in and runs all the way down to the, the uh, shores of Lake Superior where it can be packed um, where oil, tar sand oil from Alberta will get piped through here and will get picked up on ships and will get shipped elsewhere. So the pipeline is 70 years old. It's, it's falling apart. It's sprung a leak multiple times, right? And Enbridge wants to rebuild it. Um, and they, through the process of tribal consultation and being told basically to, to get lost by multiple reservations, such as my own, um, they've kind of re, they've chosen this route that runs, um, avoids tribal territory. But the problem is, is that um, through these processes of treaties and land sessions, um, th th there's a little problematic thing for Enbridge, which is that tribal presences and tribal relationships with the land don't just exist on the reservation, right? That um, there, are, there are inherent rights that we hold in the ceded territories that stretch across Northern Minnesota. And so Enbridge right now is fighting a battle with uh, water protectors and other folks that are trying to seek the pipeline from being built. And the, they are opposing the pipeline because, well, line three sprung a leak before, what's to stop it from doing, doing so again? So I could go on and on about, about other contestations and things like that, but it's, it's important now to turn to what is this all indicative of? We turn to the concept of, well, the Anthropocene, or I like to call it climate crisis, right? So the Anthropocene is pretty sexy in geography and other fields nowadays. 
And so I'll, I'll just kind of give the, the base level definition of it. Um, it's, it's an unofficial unit of geologic time or history to describe the current era where the earth where the earth and earth processes are being affected by human activities. And so we often think about geologic time as being, I, I love this, this depiction of it being kind of this spiral. You know, here in the quaternary period in a Holocene epoch, which is the, the, the units of time that are meant to describe the present day, we're also saying, well, we're also at a point now where we are beginning to impact the environment as humans at a level that has not been seen before in history. Uh, whenever the, when this has started is often debated, right? Some people say, well, it started with the, the Industrial Revolution and uh, widespread industrialization in Europe in the 17th century. Some people say, well, it began with the nuclear age, right? When we finally gained the ability to, to end life on Earth as we know it, we really have, we reached that point where the human impact on the environment was outsized compared to our, our relative position as humanity. But the fact of the matter is that climate crisis is here. One of the biggest things that we talk about when we talk when we speak about climate crisis is increasing temperatures in in places as close as the Midwest and North America and, and as broad as the world. Uh, the temperatures are rising on Earth. Uh, this is a map from NASA that talks about uh, average. Uh, temperature change over the last 50 years. So from a, there is a baseline that was established from 1951 to 1980, and that's what NASA kind of based this off of. And according to this map, as we can see here, much of the world is, is in these kind of um, shades of yellow, orange, red, and, and, and brown or maroon here, which represents rapidly increasing temperatures in some places, including the Arctic, they've seen temperatures of increases of uh, over four degrees Celsius or 7.2 degrees Fahrenheit over the last 50 years. Um, there's only a few places in the, earth, in the earth where we've seen any kind of cooling, right, which is in the middle of the North Atlantic and then uh, just off of the coast of Antarctica. But the science is clear, the data is clear, the earth is warming up. And so I'm going to use the annotation tool here to my uh, I'll say to my peril a little bit, because sometimes I feel like I have issues trying to get this off here. But people talk about, um, when they talk about climate, one of the big things on the on the right, the political right that they say is, oh, well, you know, it still snows, right? It's still, you know, it still gets cold. So, so much for climate change. And I try to point out that when we talk about climate change, it's not, it's not as simple as, um, not as simple as, as we, we make it out to be. Um, let me make sure that I can. Here we go. All right, so we think about climate. Let me draw, this is probably not the, the best location to do this, but let me draw a, uh, let me draw an X and Y axis here. I'll do this right here. So this is an X and Y axis, right? When we think about climate patterns, we oftentimes wanna think about it kind of like a sine wave, right? Where you see kind of this general, this general pattern where it goes, above and below the x-axis, but it does so in a way that um, is, is fairly stable, right? It, 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 observes, it observes an equal distance between these points. Um, I, I think about climate in that kind of way, in these climate cycles. So when we talk about climate crisis, what we see here is when we, we, when we see this warming, it creates more extremes, right? The cycle becomes more like this and it becomes more out of control. And that becomes important because then you see more, more extremes, right? In British Columbia, we just saw a bomb cyclone um, hit Vancouver Island and hit the coast and bring widespread, uh, widespread, uh, you know, um, you know, high winds and storm effects, right? Um, we just had a water spout off the coast of Vancouver. Um, there's videos circulating on Twitter about it. Um, this becomes important because, uh, you know, when you when you upset an equilibrium equilibrium in that in that kind of a way, you you start seeing that um, it creates these kind of uh, catastrophic effects. Let me try to um, get this uh, annotation off. There we go. So what does this look like? Um, what are these consequences of this? So we we see you know sea levels rise as polar ice caps melt. As I just pointed out, we see the increased volatility of weather events as seasonal patterns shift. And, you know, in, 
for people that think about things in kind of more personal terms, we see property damage increase to in, related to increased strength of seasonal events, such as increased rainfall leads to increased flooding. Um, this is an example right here, right? Um, in the Arctic, is these two maps show um, the average age of sea ice has dramatically decreased um, between 1985 and 2018. What is what does it sea ice age mean? It means that the ice is not lasting for very long, right? In 1985, the ice, a lot of the ice had been there for four plus years, which suggests stable ocean temperatures and a lack of melting. While in 2018, it's really, really clear that the sea ice doesn't last very long, right? And so it's melting. And where does that, where does that, where does that melt go to? It increases to uh, it leads into an increase of sea levels. Um, and so this is one of the examples I talk about when I when I talk about the Anthropocene and then I talk about, uh, you know, kind of this climate crisis. This is something that affects um, Arctic communities, such as Inuit communities, uh, very, very deeply, right? Um, it leads to um, kind of uh, disruptions in the ways that animals that they, they rely on for food sources um, kind of migrate through the Arctic. Um, it also, um, that in turn leads to kind of disruptions in cultural patterns and uh, patterns and, and things that are that are important to you know inner communities to be able to pass on to, to future generations. Uh, another example is the island nation of Kiribati, right? Kiribati is a is a former British colony located in the South Pacific that gained independence in the late 1970s. Uh, Kiribati is located on a series of uh, low-lying atolls, right? Uh, similarly to other Pacific island nations. Um, the highest elevation in the country is only several meters high. Um, and there's not a lot of space there. Um, the, the largest city and capital of South Tarawa has 50,000 people um, cramped into a space that is probably at most uh, several square miles in size, right? It's kind of the, the size of like your average small American town. This nation in particular is very susceptible to sea level rise. Um, you know, not only are, does increased sea levels mean that these atolls are being flooded, but um, it also means that when tropical cyclones pass through, the storm surges that come from it can have disastrous effects on the community. Um, it has gotten to the point now where the leadership has basically started to send uh, I Kiribati peoples, uh, the, the indigenous peoples of Kiribati, to places like Australia and New Zealand to get job training for uh, preparation for the, the likelihood that one day the country will be completely inundated and they'll have to leave. Um, the, country, the government of Kiribati has bought lands on the main island in Fiji, Vanua Leva, or Vanua Levu, saying that these, this land is probably going to be where we are going to have to move to as a nation um, if, our, if, our, if our nation is flooded underwater. So for them, uh, it's, it's not something that uh, climate crisis is something that is threatening their very existence as a nation. And it goes on, it goes on and on in different geographical locations, right? So, um, simply put, indigenous peoples, they are at extreme risk of, of climate change due to geographic location and other factors. There was a paper that just came out in science um, last week by Kyle Powers White and, and some other and other folks that actually spoke to this and they said, due to these processes of land theft and colonialism, indigenous peoples are oftentimes placed in, in the United States into these areas that are at extreme risk of uh, damage and effects from climate crisis. Um, and to reiterate the examples, right, Pacific Islanders, not just in Kiribati, but other places are at particular risk of being flooded out of their nations. And as we pointed out with the Arctic, um, Arctic peoples are facing these cultural and economic consequences of decreased ice cover. So, Climate crisis is something that has really grabbed settler consciousness over the last few years, right? Uh, everyone remembers, uh, everyone remembers 2012 and the uh, the idea that the end of the world was coming, and with increased uh, temperatures and with all these climatic events effects coming, everyone is asking, how can we stop this, right? The apocalypse is on its, is on its way. Um, how are we going to be able to combat it, this, right? Um, there's folks over there at, at COP26 in Glasgow that are trying to answer this very question. If you talk to indigenous peoples, they'll say, now, nah, it's not the apocalypse, it's just another apocalypse, right? Um, scholars such as Kyle White have said, indigenous nations have already faced apocalypse and these dystopias, right? Multiple times 
the uh, colonial processes of land theft and environmental harm and, and other forms of colonial harms. And scholars such as White, who is one of my, my heroes in like kind of the pantheon of my, my indigenous scholar kind of like idols, um, you know, scholars like him, they point towards indigenous responses to these apocalypses as potential models on how to contend with climate crisis. So some of these responses, um, you know, really centered around kind of models of adaptation and mitigation, right? Um, the idea that we can mitigate effects that can that can be mitigated, and then if we can't mitigate the effects, uh, we adapt to them instead. And they're often based on cultural frameworks and centered around resurgence of cultural and political sovereignty. Um, this book to the right here is a publication that was developed by several tribal nations in the upper Midwest that talked about, well, how do we adapt to climate change while still holding true to our cultures and ensuring that we can pass these down to future generations? And they go in depth on how to do this in a really holistic and really complete way. Um, a lot of times when people think about indigenous responses to climate crisis, right, they think about, uh, you know, them indigenous peoples going out and protesting and, you know, demonstrations and, you know, the water protector camps at Standing Rock and things like that. I say, and I teach a class on indigenous environmental activism, like I'm teaching that this semester at UVic, I say, well, it goes much further than protests and what settler society characterizes as protest, right? Sometimes it actually, it go, it, it, sometimes it's as simple as doing, is, is doing these activities based in cultural frameworks and being able to call on those frameworks and call on these histories and contemporaneous relationships with land in order to help defend it. Um, you don't have to just go out and protest with signs to do that. Sometimes it's just as simple as doing the things you would do in everyday life. But to give a few examples that indigenous nations are helping to protect their environments, um, they are among some of the leaders in the world of, in monitoring of the effects of climate change by indigenous nations. I think some of the work that we do at Leech Lake related to this is work that um, is worthy of being funded by major universities, but oftentimes it's just community members doing this kind of thing, right? Monitoring water quality, monitoring temperatures, things like that. Uh, the preservation of animals and plants that are important to indigenous nations. I, I use bison for an example. Um, the Grand Portage Band of, of, of Chippewa that are located at the very far northeastern tip of Minnesota um, relied on moose for the longest time as a source of food. Well, with increasing temperatures, moose are heading north into Canada um, to try to find more suitable habitats. And the Grand Portage Band said, well, darn, well, the moose are gone. What are we going to do? And somebody said, you know what we ought to do? We're going to do a pilot project where we're going to bring bison onto the reservation and we're going to keep a herd of bison. They're similar enough to moose. We can keep those and we can use that as a source of food and, and sustainably harvest them. And as far as I know, this has been a fairly successful program. Um, and of course, I've talked about, you know, in cases where you can't mitigate these effects, you adapt to them. And sometimes it, it, you know, this is an example of sometimes you introduce alternative species as, re as replacements for animals and plants that are rapidly disappearing. Um, so this is one example of that. There's other examples of, of plants being brought in that are similar to native plants that have been chased out um, in order to help protect biodiversity and such. So I'm a geographer. Um, most of us are geographers here. And the question is always, well, what can geography tell the world about anthropogenic crisis or climate crisis? Well, as a field that is uniquely situated um, to tackle questions of climate crisis, right? We're at the intersection of space, place, humans, and environment. And there are fields, subfields in geography, such as political ecology and my field, human environment interactions that, that do this. We are in a really, really great place to lead conversations such as this. Um, many geographers are already doing this, right? Um, I have to give a shout out to uh, Dr. Farhana Sultana at Syracuse University, who, um, if, you, if you're on Twitter and you don't follow her, she is a phenomenal, phenomenal follow. Um, just always um, just spreading the good word about the work that she does and spreading the word about climate, climate crisis and how we can tackle that, right? Um, but she's not the only one. This is something that is really becoming prominent in geography nowadays. I um, mean, I could spend an hour talking about all the scholars that do work on this sort of thing, even in your, even as close as Mizzou, right? Um, but what's important is they're all doing important work to tackle these kinds of questions. This is something that we are intimately concerned with in geography, and it's really kind of helped drive the direction of our discipline. Um, the other thing about geography is it's very interdisciplinary. Um, my One of my mentors in my master's program at UMD used to drive me wild as he would ask, well, DeAndre, tell me what geography is. And I would talk about 
the ways that uh, geography was is inherently interdisciplinary. And he would say, well, if geography can interface with everything, then what is, then is geography really a discipline? And they would just drive me nuts. And I'd be like, shut up, man. Of course it is. Why well, wouldn't actually tell him to shut up, of course, but I would, I would defend it. And I still hold true to that to the present day. Geography is so interdisciplinary that oftentimes I view people as geographers, even if they not, even if um, the broader broader society does not. Um, one of the people that I have the great pleasure of working with in kind of my day to day work is Dr. Max Lieberl of the uh, Memorial University of Newfoundland in Labrador, up in Canada. Um, I'm a co investigator in their Clear Lab. And Max, Max got their PhD, I believe, in, in kind of arts and like the visual arts. Max works in a geography department. Max is a professor, a tenured professor in a geography department. And people are like, that's kind of weird. And I say, no, that's not weird at all. Because Max works on plastics, right? Max does amazing work on marine plastics and pollution and connects these things to processes of colonialism. And I'm like, that's geographic work right there. And people are like, is it? I'm like, oh yes, it definitely is. Um, I consider Kyle White to be a geographer as well, even if he may not consider himself to be a geographer. Um, it, we are so interdisciplinary in our connections that um, you know, geographic principles and geographic concepts have a way of, uh, of a way in coming through in uh, many different fields. So the one thing about geography that sometimes we, I feel like that we, we struggle with though, is that we are very global North focused. So the global North is defined as countries, you know, oftentimes I think it's another synonym, synonym when we talk about quote, the West, right? These industrialized countries are uh, European countries and settler colonies such as the United States and Canada and Australia that have had an outsized role in driving, um, in, in kind of driving global economy and global politics. Um, oftentimes, our conversations in geographies center in, in, you know, conversations around climate issues and indigenous issues focuses on the global north. Uh, bringing in uh, Dr. Sultana again, she's one of these people that, that says, no, we need to focus on the global south too. We need to focus on marginalized peoples that oftentimes have not been allowed to come to the fore, you know, in places such as India and Africa and Latin America and indigenous peoples even here in the, you know, settler colonial metropole of the United States. Um, because climate crisis is global, right? Indigeneity is global. There are not just indigenous peoples in the United States and Canada, like there are indigenous peoples all around the world. And we are better served by bringing global voices into these conversations. So I'm a very future oriented person, right? I love looking into the future. I love short term futures, medium term futures, long term futures. I mean, hell, I, I bug my wife all the time because uh, I love planning things out. Um, such as us going home to Minnesota and North Dakota for winter break. That's our big planning thing right now. But I also love talking about futures of geography. And the future of geography is extremely bright. I think that in order to be able to tackle this concept of climate crisis, of the Anthropocene, geography will need to pivot in several ways in the future. I think that we will need to continue to turn towards interdisciplinary collaborations with other fields. Um, I have increasingly become of the mind that geography as it is, we are constantly almost threatening to rupture our boundaries as a discipline. That has been the central debate of this discipline over the last 75 years is, well, what is geography? Can we draw really hard boundaries around geography? And I'm of the mind that we need to cut that out. We need to stop that. And we need to be prepared to rupture as a discipline and become more porous if we need to be in order to answer these questions. Because there is no one canonical or theoretical way to approach this type of thing. And we need to be open to different a diversity of perspectives. And if that means we talk to an other, other disciplines, then, then so be it. Um, I also think, obviously, I'm the chair of the Indigenous Peoples Specialty Group of the American Association of Geographers, and so I have a large stake in this kind of work of increasing visibility of marginalized and minoritized geographers, especially Indigenous voices within the field. Um, we, indigenous geographers, um, including, you know, your very own Mark Palmer, do some really, really amazing work. And I, I think that oftentimes in geography, that work has often been placed as kind of a side piece to other work that's being done, and I say, no, if we are going to really uh, tackle this as a global facing discipline, that work needs to be placed in the center, right? So in the last couple of slides here, um, and I think I'm gonna breach 50 minutes just a little bit and I apologize for that, but I really wanna share 
kind of the exciting work that I want to, that I'm doing in this regard. And so I want to introduce you to a little thing that I'm developing up at the University of Victoria, referred to as the GIF Lab. This is a brand new lab at UVic Geography um, that got started because it's my lab and I just got there. Um, um, UVic is really is really kind of unique in that we are a very lab focused department on um, pretty much every faculty member runs their own lab um, that that focuses kind of similarly on topics that the the the, the faculty member or the PI are focused on. So GIF Lab, uh, the full name is a Geographic Indigenous Futures Collaboratory or Geographic Indigenous Futures Lab. I picked that because I was like, we need a catchy acronym like CLEAR, which I'm a member of as well. And I said, GIF, um, GIF is catchy. We can do all kinds of fun things like that. And, it, and our name actually makes sense. And so that's our full name. And the GIF Lab serves two functions, right? It's going to be my graduate research group, as well as a place for Indigenous perspectives and Indigenous communities to bring their voices into the UVic Geography Department and in academia as a whole. And that's kind of our, our provisional logo there on the left-hand side. And I'm totally looking forward to getting merchandise made with that and like giving it out at conferences and things like that. So, I'm in the process of building this lab right now. And much like our friend, the Dash Hound right there, I plan to be extremely tenacious and strong-willed in doing this. And so one of the things that I'm trying to determine now is, well, what's our lab mission? What do we wanna be as a lab? Who do we wanna serve? How do we wanna go about doing this work? Because that's really, really important. Bringing it back to geographic things that may not be recognized as geography, there are already models of diverse lab work out there, right? The Clear Lab is a really, really great example of a lab that's based out of a geography department that does work that may not even be explicitly defined as geography sometimes, but still has deep impacts with Indigenous communities there in the North and with other communities in Atlantic Canada. And so, you know, we, we almost, I almost view us as kind of a daughter lab of CLEAR in a way. And I wonder, I don't know what Max Lieberon would say if, if they heard me saying that, but you know, we, we kind of want to continue that model of being a very forward facing lab that is willing to be flexible and to do work that is vitally important to communities. Um, and so that's, that's a thought process that I go through. And we're going to have physical space in our building on campus. We're going to be getting a brand new lab space um, that's, that's being renovated for us right now. But also building a community is really, really important. And, and so I think about that in the way that I recruit graduate students, how I go about talking about the lab collaborators that I bring in, because you know the physical space is fine, but can we build a safe, nurturing community for students that are going, going to be coming in um, that, you know, especially if they're Indigenous students, uh, make up a very, very small portion of the discipline, right? How can we make sure that we can create a space for them in a, in a discipline that has historically been colonial and rather violent to uh, minoritized scholars? And really, you know, as I said, we're always forward facing. So we, you know, the question that we really want to aim ourselves towards is, well, what, what might a geographic Indigenous future look like? Well, the bad news is that this is not an easy question to answer because each indigenous nation and even individual communities will know best of what their desired futures look like to them. I can't go into a community and say, this is what your future should look like because they're going to say, well, what the hell are you talking about, right? We know best what, 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 our, what we want our futures to be. And so for the GIF lab, our job is to listen to these communities and say, if that is the future that you want for yourself, we will work and put our, our put our tools, our privilege, our resources at your disposal to help bring you towards that future. Um, and really, this is really important. The work towards these diverse futures must be led by the communities themselves. The idea, my dream is that we do projects that eventually at some point, um, instead of them just ending and us leaving the community, we say, okay, we've helped you with the work. You are at a place where you can carry on this work without us. And that will be the mark of a successful project to be um, as much so if even more so than the amount of grant funding we get or the amount of accolades that we get. Um, and this really comes from um, another really, really admired scholar of mine, Leanne Simpson in, in her book, um, as we always have done, she talks about this idea of radical resurgent politics of land, that being in connection with land and getting back to the land and allowing that to drive the ways that we approach indigenous resurgence is going to make all the difference in the work that we do. So 
the next steps in, in the work that I'm doing towards these geographic Indigenous futures. Um, we're in the process of, of organizing a symposium. Um, a plan is to hold a symposium every year about geographic Indigenous futures um, related to selected topics. Uh, the first one is tentatively planned for spring 2022. We have the funding now, we just need to get all the logistics of doing this. And this will be a, a virtual symposium that we will host worldwide to bring people in. Um, kind of the, our, our big introduction, well, today kind of is a, in a way is a kind of our, our kind of like soft introduction to, uh, to broader audiences, but we're going to hold a series of sessions at the AAG annual meeting, the big conference in geography on geographic Indigenous futures, an in-person session and a virtual session. I'm going to continue relationship building with Indigenous nations, um, you know, local nations on Vancouver Island and the greater Victoria first and then other nations as time goes on. Um, and then, of course, uh, people to staff the lab. And so I'm in the middle of graduate student recruitment right now. Um, and so if you're interested in going to graduate school in geography, uh, talk to me. We might have a place at UVic for you. And you can come study up in beautiful Vancouver Island and see orcas and uh, be, be no more than a mile away from the ocean wherever you live in the city. So I could keep talking for like another hour, but I'm really anxious and eager to hear your questions and to converse with you all. So in my tribe's language, we don't have a word for goodbye because our, our idea is that we always want to talk to people again. We always believe that people will be brought into our lives again. And so instead we say something like miigwech gigawathamin, which means thank you, talk to you again soon. If you are interested in, in contacting me um, beyond this talk, here's my contact information right here on the right hand side, uh, dsmiles at uvic.ca. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter at uh, DeAndre Smiles, and you can see pictures of my cat and see my moderate takes on geography, indigenous issues, and society more broadly. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Wow, DeAndre, thank you so much. That was amazing. Really, really appreciate it. Um, do we have any questions uh, about uh, DeAndre's talk, his ideas, um, ideas that you have that, that you, you might like to intersect with DeAndre's? Questions? Hey, DeAndre, this is Mark Palmer. How are you? It's good to see you again. Doing well, Mark. How are you? I'm great. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, sundown here. Colors are in full bloom. Hey, you know what? Um, the Indigenous Futures Research Movement is really uh, uh, taking a, a jump start and it's shooting forward. Do you have any suggestions for a, or consider uh, creating a bibliography uh, of relevant studies that graduate students could use uh, to maybe think about moving into this line of research? Because I think it's really, really important. Yeah, so I think that I, I, I really, I like the idea of creating a bibliography. I guess I can kind of, um... It's in the works right now. I'm actually, this is this is the basis of a publication that I'm working on that kind of points towards this. Um, a lot of the indigenous futures work, surprisingly, is 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 has a lot of a lot of it's been focused on the arts and like there's been a lot of like media studies about it. And I think that's really, really cool that um, you know, that there's there's all these diverse fields out there. And I've been like really anxious, like, how can we bring this into conversation with with geography? Um, and one of the things that we're we're gonna tackle that in my class here in a couple of weeks. Um, you know, as far as the resources that are out there, unfortunately, I don't have like, I, I, I would, you know, I wish that I had like a, a detailed bibliography. Um, I think that, the, you know, creating a bibliography on that, I think that would be huge. I think that would be a really, really great resource for, for graduate students. Um, and I, that's something there, whether, the, whether that's something that somebody creates or when this piece of mine uh, makes it through the, the review process and hopefully ends up in a journal someplace, you know, that's one of the things that I'm going to tackle as well. Um, I know in that one, I, I kind of focus more kind of on geography as a discipline, and it would be really interesting to see somebody tackle that from a very interdisciplinary kind of standpoint, right, of like other things that are not geography that could still be of use to, to the students in this field. Thank you, Mark. Do we have any other questions for Dr. Smiles? Um, if I could. 
I would like to um, talk about or hear more hear more from you, Dr. Small. Sorry, I can hear myself echoing with amongst my colleagues. Um, that about uh, Dr. White's perspectives on indigenous, um, you know, dystopia and the environment and the climate crisis, and if maybe you could expand on that a bit more, because I think that that's a really important concept to dig into, and I appreciate you bringing it up because it's great work. Yeah, so the kind of the the works of Dr. White's that I really engaged with, um, and and I really got into his work. Um, there was an NSF workshop that uh, Mark and I and and and, uh, and Kyle were all at, at at Haskell Indian Nations University a couple of years ago, and I really got keyed into kind of his work where he talks about. Um, he, there's a piece of his that talks about um, indigenous science fiction, right? And kind of this idea of indigenous science fiction. And he says, well, in like settler science fiction, we focus, there's, there's so much focus on the end of the world and like all these like, you know, disastrous things happening to humanity, whether that's aliens coming in and, you know, invading us and taking us over or like, you know, um, I think about a movie like this really crappy movie in the early 2000s called The Core, where like the Earth's core started to like, you know, there's a reaction there and we needed to like, you know, and kind of typical settler bravado, oh, let's go drop a nuke in the middle of the core and it'll, you know, it'll solve all of our issues and things like that. You know, and there's this like increasing preoccupation with apocalypse, right? Like we're, we're, we're like so obsessed with like trying to figure out the end of the world and how we can possibly avoid it. And Kyle White says, well, you talk to like some indigenous aunties, right? If you go into a community and you talk to the aunties, like these, these old, these older women, they'll say well, you know, there was a time when, you know, we had herds of a certain kind of animal coming through our community, or there was a time when you would be able to swim in this body of water without like, you know, without it being polluted or things like that. Or there was a time when we lived, we lived in this place, you know, in relation to this, you know, this land feature that we were violently dispossessed and, and, and forced to move away from it. And kind of what he's saying is he's making that argument that he's saying, well, through these processes of colonialism, uh, the apocalypse has already come, like molt many, many times over, right? Um, I mean, I, I think about my own tribal community and the fact that we we are prohibited by various federal statutes and land tenure uh, regimes from really being fully in relationship with the land that we have because have, most of it is a national forest, um, and the other however many percent um, that adds up to the 96% of our, our land that on our reservation that is not under tribal control or held by settler landowners that have cabins there and will call the cops on like to say if, say if like, you know, say if, you know, my, my sweet old great aunt wants to go out and, and pick and pick uh, some berries from a grove and she happens to cross over onto like settler land, they can call the cops on her for trespassing, even though she has a treaty guaranteed right to be able to have access to like, you know, those berries and that kind of medicine. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's one of those things where that's, apoc that's apocalyptic too, right? Like that's not the big flashy end of the world, but to indigenous communities, a lot of times when you sever that connection to the land, that is the end of a world for them, right? That is an end of, uh, that is an attempted end of kind of these, these webs of relations that we have. Um, and so Kyle kind of points towards that and says, well, you know, if we really were serious about tackling climate crisis, we would pay attention to those apocalypses and we might learn something from indigenous nations that have been able to maintain relationships with the land and maintain cultural sovereignty in spite of, uh, in spite of the, uh, you know, this apocalyptic, um, you know, conditions that have been placed upon them. It's very, so in, Indigenous people, I can speak for Ojibwe people, right? We kind of have very dark senses of humor. Um, you'll never really see like an indigenous, like an Ojibwe person be like, ah, oh, you know, the world's ending. Like, what are we going to do? They'll be like, hey, things are kind of crappy, but like, ah, just go, you know, just go be out there and, and like go be out on the land and like do the things that you would be doing anyways, and you'll be all right. And I kind of like to liken that to the ways that um, indigenous nations kind of approach these apocalyptic things. They kind of say, well, this has happened, but we can't sit here and feel sorry about ourselves, right? Because the existence of our peoples are in our cultural identities are at stake here. And so instead of sitting here worrying about the future, we're going to make steps to try to, we're going to take steps to try to make the future um, much stronger for ourselves. So I hope that at least starts to answer your question, uh, Dr. Gulenkozy. 
That was great. Uh, do we have any other uh, questions from the audience? Well, I would like to thank, again, uh, thank you, Dr. Smiles. This has been amazing. Um, we really, really appreciate your time, your um, intellect and your spirit. Um, it's, uh, it's just wonderful. Uh, and thank you for being part of the university's Native American Heritage Month. And thanks to everyone who was in the audience today to, and engaging with Dr. Smile's ideas and thinking and, and those of his people, I uh, really appreciate it. And again, please look at the upcoming events for Native American Heritage Month. Uh, definitely check them out. Uh, they are all on the College of Arts and Science website. All you gotta do is Google um, Native American Heritage Month Mizzou. <laughs> And that'll get you there. Uh, thanks again to Kelly. Uh, thanks again to Dr. Erb. Um, and thanks to the College of Arts and Science and the Department of Geography. And again, Dr. Smiles, thank you very much. And we will see you all somewhere down the road. All right. Bye, everyone.